Parshas Pidchas. Second longest parsha in the Torah. And it's on page... What is it? 876. Okay. So... <clears throat> so yesterday we spoke about Pidchas... Uh, Pinchas resorting to vigilante vigilante tactics to kill the two people who were doing the Avera. Now, if you look in the Mishnah in Pirkei Avos, it's towards the end of the first Mishnah. It's Mishnah Yud Beis. So it says, Hillel v'shamai kiblu mehem. Hillel Omer. Heve mi talmid of shel Aaron. You should be a disciple of Aaron. Ohev shalom v'rodev shalom. You should love peace, and you should pursue peace. Ohev esabrios. You should love people. Umekorven la Torah. Draw them near to Torah. So we know that Aaron was an ohev shalom v'rodev shalom. He loved peace, and he pursued peace. Rodev shalom. So the standard explanation, standard explanation is that Aaron, you know, he did everything he can to pursue peace. But Rode Shalom, can I ask just everybody to put away any technologi technological implements that is not respectful to Torah. So if one or the other, it can't be both. So Aaron is a Rode Ohev Shalom and a Rode Shalom. Rode Shalom means, the plain meaning is that he pursues peace, right? peace at all costs. Right? That's a mistake. That is a common, that's the liberal, leftist, uh, woke uh, joke uh, that, 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 that peace at all costs. Because sometimes, sometimes uh, 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 peace is not available and sometimes you can't, uh, what do you call it, uh, if you're being attacked by hoodies, uh, so sometimes you've got to blow up their port. Uh, that, that sometimes is the best, best can be a form of communication. Uh, you know, we're not going to tolerate this. You're not going to just send bomb us. So you know, we're going to bomb us away. We're going to just uh, turn the other cheek, as they say. Well, that's nonsense. Number one. Number two, if a person sees sinners or evildoers doing something, so that's also Rodev Sholom. Rodev Sholom means that our own, we think that our own is just a pacifist and is everything, you know, with always just flying a white flag. Aaron, Rodev Shalom, the commentary say, when he had to, even Aaron Akoin, sweet, gentle Aaron Akoin, when he had to, he would Rodev, or what's a Rodev in Halacha? A Rodev is a pursuer, somebody who's pursuing somebody. He would pursue the sinners, he would Rodev Shalom, that means to break up the Shalom among the sinners. That's also called Rodev Shalom. So you got to know when to turn it on and when to turn it off. So what happens? Vedabra Hashem Moshe Lemur. Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron Hakoid, Heshiv es Hamasi me al Israel. Pinchas turned back my wrath from the Jewish people. Bikano es kinasi besocham, by taking my vengeance among them, where he goes and he kills those two people. And I'm sure, what did Pinchas say afterwards? I'm sure, what did he say to Zimri? Get the point? <laughs> so, maybe not. The, uh, right, at the end of the day, Pinchas takes the law into his own hand. He kills them. Therefore, I didn't destroy the Jewish people. Now, the, the greatness of Pinchas is that, he, you notice he said, Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron HaKohen. Pinchas, the son of Elazar, the son of Aaron. Why are we tracing him to Aaron? Why is Pinchas being traced to Aaron? Because Aaron is the ultimate pacifist. See, you wouldn't expect Pinchas to go and be the guy who's going to do this, the guy who comes from a family of an Aaron Akoin. The answer is, no, no, no. He is a descendant of Aaron Akoin because Aaron himself would have done this if it was necessary. It's not that Aaron would have said, oh, that's terrible. You know, you should really just talk about it, discuss it, have some sort of meeting, have a conference. Right? You know, people say, well, why did Pinchas have to be so violent? Why couldn't he just talk to Zimri after davening the next morning and say, really, you shouldn't be do that, don't do that anymore. Now, why do you have to, well, you have to go and kill people? The answer is yes, yeah, sometimes it is. You know, the Medrash says that to kill a Russia is like bringing a korban. It's like bringing an offering. It's like bringing an offering, a peace offering. In this case, it was a peace's offering. But it's a peace offering. Okay, so Pinchas, yeah, now, the, the, the idea here is, the idea here is that, that look at the next passage. L'chein amor, he didn't know say lo, is brisi shal. Now, I want to ask you a question. In World War II, 
when the uh, Enola, Enola Gray, was that the name of the plane? The Enola, Enola Gray was the plane that, was flo that, that dropped the first atom bomb was called Fat Boy, right, on Hiroshima. What would your reaction be <coughs> if the pilot was then given a Nobel Peace Prize? What would your reaction is given a Nobel Peace Prize? He just killed 100,000 people and he's given a Nobel Peace Prize. Nowadays it's possible. Nowadays it's possible. I want to tell you something. He would have deserved one. Why? Because they put an end to the killing in the war. <coughs> They're attacking you. They're attacking you. They're not getting the message. They're not being cooperative. So we're going to put an end to it. All right, that's it. Now, how many people have spared lives, been spared because you took it, you dropped the bomb? Most people would say, well, give them a Purple Heart or a, what do you call it, a Medal of Bravery, a Medal of, a Medal of Honor. So what does Pinchas do? Pinchas goes, commits the single most graphic, dis graphically described act of violence in the Torah. <coughs> and then what does Hashem say? L'chein hinin inosin lo is brisi shalom, I give him my covenant of peace. He gets the Nobel Peace Prize. Pinchas gets the, gets the Peace Prize. Would, would, does that make any sense? Does that, am I, it, goes, it runs contrary to everything, to everything we understand. The answer is, <coughs> sorry, the answer is, by the way, uh, vigilantism, there's a difference between vigilantism and standing up and killing someone. Let's say you see Ruvain is chasing Shimon to kill him. What's the halacha? Are you allowed to kill Ruvain to prevent him from killing Shimon? Yeah. Not allowed to. Not allowed to. You have to. If Ruvain is pursuing Shimon, unjustifiably, then you, and you're able, you have an obligation to get involved and save Shimon, even at the cost of Ruvain's life. That's not vigilantism. That's called, that's something anybody would have to do. If you would ask Bazdin, what should I do? They say, go kill the guy. Vigilantism is when you're killing a guy to prevent him from doing an Avera. He's not a life, he's not threatening anybody. He's doing his own Avera. And the Avera over here was that he's living with a non-Jewish woman. There, the Torah says that you've got an obligation. There, the Torah says only if you're, what do you call it, if you're burning with passion for God's honor, which I told you yesterday has to be 100%. Then you're alive. So what does Pinchas get? Brisi Shalom. What's Brisi Shalom? A covenant of peace. Why does he get a covenant of peace? Of all the prizes he should get, and again, if you, if, 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 if you give a guy the, the Nobel Peace Prize for bombing Hiroshima, People would say, well, why are you giving him a Nobel? Listen, Barack Obama got a Nobel Peace Prize before he did anything. And Yasser Arafat was given a Nobel Peace Prize. Right? They, they, you know, they, what do you call Yasser Arafat? I should say, you know, Yasser, he's given a Nobel. So, so the, their, their standards mean nothing to us, obviously. But the Torah's approach is, one second, did you do the right thing or you did the wrong thing? If you killed a pursuer, you deserve a prize for killing the pursuer. And you killed, what did you do here? You stopped the plague from the Jewish people by killing these people. There, there you get the peace prize. You stopped an entire world war. <coughs> Sorry, you stopped the entire war by dropping a bomb. You deserve a prize. So he got, they didn't give him the Nobel Peace Prize. Right? It's, only my, it's only my idea. Nobody asked me. Well, only because I wasn't alive. Had I been alive, they would have asked me. But I wasn't alive. But if they would have asked me, I would have said, yeah, give the guy a Nobel Peace Prize. Do you know that the pilot was named uh, uh, <coughs> with Char, uh, Cri Crippets or something, something like that? I forgot. It, I forgot his name. They asked him, "Didn't your conscience bother you?" Well, it never bothered me. It never bothered me. They had to be done. What, what bothered? What's the difference? The difference is drop. What if they kill one person, kill a hundred thousand people? What's the difference? If you have no conscience for killing one person, you have no conscience. If you have conscience, you should have conscience for one person also. Even the Israeli pilots who bomb in, in, in Gaza, they said, they said listen, you know, these people are trying to kill my family. What, 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 no conscience over here. You'd be, you'd be wrong for not doing what you're doing if they're trying to kill your family. Of course, you have to depend on your family for people who are wrong for trying to kill them. So over here, over here he says it, it, he gets a, a peace prize. Now, why is that? So let's take it at a plain meaning, and then we'll take it at a deeper meaning. Yeah, what do you say? The ends justify the means. The ends justify the means. No, we never say that. We never say the ends justify the means in halacha. The, the, the ends don't justify the means. The means have to be kosher too, but they were kosher means over here. To the contrary, no, no, we never say the ends justify the means. I can't break Shabbos. I can't break Shabbos because I want to go somewhere to help a little old lady cross the street. 
Right, the means justify the ends. The me- well, the means and the ends have to be justified. In halacha, you can't break Shabbos. I can't drive my car down the block to help a little old lady cross the street. But I, the, the ends were good. Yeah, but the means were no good. You can't. The means have to be. The means have to be kosher also in halacha. You can't. The, the, the ends don't justify the means. The ends don't justify the means. Here, he gets a peace prize. Now, why is he getting? What is this promise of peace? So the first basic level is that you know if you go and you kill somebody. What have you always got to worry about? What's that? The cops. Which consequences? Like death sentences in regards. Huh? There's no death sentence here. Yeah, then he knew he was allowed to do it from a halachic point of view. What do you got to worry about? Conscience. conscience? He's got no conscience. Is that a relative? Yeah. What about, what about, what do you call? What about Zimri's relatives? What about his brothers coming after? You better go into a government uh, witness protection program. What are, you know, they've got these guys who turn state witness, they, you know, state witness, and they put them in a government, but they got to protect these guys. Guy goes in, he testifies against some mafia guys. You know, they give him a whole new identity, and they move him out to Omaha, Nebraska, or Santa Fe, New Mexico, or something. They get, get this guy out of here. And not only that, the federal, he's got federal agents who protect him, and these federal agents have said they can't stand these guys. They can't, because these guys are low lowlifes also. Remember, if you turn state's evidence, that means he was a criminal too. So this guy's a criminal. He ratted out on he ratted out his his other fellow criminals, and now these federal agents got to go protect this guy in the witness protection program. The guys have said we can't stand these guys. These guys are low lowlifes, so we have no we have no choice. This is our job. Now Pinchas is nervous. What about Zimri's relative? Not only that, what tribe does Zimri come from? Shimon. Shimon. What do we know about Shimon's history? What happened when Shimon's sister was violated? They, 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 they destroyed a whole city. That was, they were bar mitzvah at the time. There was Shimon and Levi. They were bar, only bar mitzvah. That was their bar mitzvah drasha. Uh, how's that for a bar mitzvah speech? Come here, Stomites. You know, <laughs> I mean, Shemites. <laughs> that, was their, that, was their bar mitzvah, that was their bar mitzvah gift. There was the performance at their bar mitzvah. That's what, so you say, you know, listen, you're talking about Shev and Shimon over here. These people don't take kindly. So first thing is, Pinchas is here, though, you got nothing to worry. They're not going to take revenge. Number one, they're not going to take revenge. Number two, let's take it a little deeper. The original sin of the Eitzah Das, what was it called? The tre- Eitzah Das, the tree of life, the tree of knowledge, which was what? Tov Vera. The tree of life was Tov Vera. Eitzah Das, Tov Vera. That's what it says. The tree of knowledge, knowing good and evil. Now, from the time that Adam Arishon ate from that tree, prompted by his wife, but from the time that they ate from that tree, from that fruit, which was not what? What wasn't that fruit? It was kosher. The, 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 fruit, the fruit is kosher. It was not what? It wasn't an apple. It wasn't allowed, and it wasn't an apple, right? Yeah, you're right. It wasn't allowed. It wasn't an apple. There's an opinion that it was a fig. There's another opinion that it was a grape. There's another opinion that it was a wheat. There's another opinion that it was an esrog. There are four opinions, three in the Gomorrah, one in the Medrash. But whatever it is, whatever it is, it wasn't an apple. The apple came from the King James Bible. That's where that nonsense started. And then Hollywood got a hold of it, and so that, 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 and then it's history. But the, 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 at the end of the day, at the end of the day, Eit Sadas Tovarah, two things happened. Number one, death came to the world. There was no death before that. And number two, there is nothing that is perfectly good that doesn't have a little bad in it. If you buy a new car, a perfect new car, a nice electric electric car, but there's still the hassle, you know, what do you call it? Now they're having trouble with the, with the, with the, with the charging stations. Uh, if you, if you, what you, you got a beautiful, got a great job that pays you way more than you deserve, which I told you that's the definition of a great job, pays you way more than you deserve, it's just, you know, one guy in the office is always a pain. But, so it's never going to be perfect. No situation is perfect. No situation is ever going to be perfect. That's eight Adas Tov Vira. All Tov is going to have some Ra in it, and all Ra has a little bit of Tov in it. There's no completely 100% situation in either direction. Now, the Jewish people had reached a level of what we would call Shleimus, Shleimus means perfection. What created the flaw in the Jewish people? What created the flaw? This Baal Peor business. These Midianite girls, the Moabite girls and the Baal Peor. This bro- it broke the, the, the Shleimus of the Jewish people. Who restored it? Pinchas. So since he restored Shleimus, 
perfection or as perfect as people could be. Therefore, he himself is no longer under the influence of the Eitz Adas, Tovara. If you're no longer under the influence of the tree, that means what happens? No death. There's no death. What do we know about Pinchas? He knows his Brisi Shalom, he gets a covenant of peace. Pinchas never dies. Who do we find out he is later? Elia Navi. Pinchas is Elia Navi, and it's interesting because in the Nach you never find a, it never says in the Nach anywhere that Pinchas does it. It records the death of most of the big people when they died, when they lived, when they died. It never tells us about the death of Pinchas anywhere in the Nach. It doesn't say that Pinchas died. Anywhere it doesn't say Pinchas. And he, according to our tradition, Pinchas becomes Elia Navi. And Elia Navi shows up where? At every bris. Elio is Malach HaBris. Elio is the, is, is the, is the Malach HaBris. What was Pinchas fighting for the Kedusha over here? The Kedusha of the Bris, which is what a Jewish man was defiling. And therefore Pinchas is Elio and he's Malach HaBris. Pinchas is, 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 is Elio Anavi. So Pinchas gets a Brisi Shalom, he gets a covenant of peace, Pinchas never dies. Okay, now, the... Um, he changed his name from to When that happened is not clear. When that happens, at what point? It's a good question. At some point, some point, Pinchas becomes a Leo. It's that, not clear if it went, when that happens. <coughs> yeah, go ahead. I heard that it said that Leo now becomes there because he came up to the Jews. There is another reason why he comes. That, that's, that's true. There, there's another reason that he comes to Israel because he once, he once said something about the Jew, negative about the Jewish people uh, not, not fulfilling the mitzvah of bris. But Pinchas and Leo, there's no coincidence that he is also the one who's fighting for the bris over here. Okay, so Elio, so Pinchas gets this, what's called a covenant of Shalom. Covenant of Shalom means, it, it, it means that he's going to be Shalom, he's going to be whole. And he's going to live, he, he lives forever. The, the Gemara mentions there are nine people, there are actually two opinions, nine people or 11 people, who actually, what the way the Gemara puts it is they entered Gan Eden alive. That they never died as we understand death. Yeah. Why didn't uh, uh, Elazar? Why didn't he take? We, why didn't he do it? Why didn't Pinchas's father Elazar? Why didn't Why didn't Elazar do it? That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I don't have an answer. I don't know. I don't know why Elazar Why Elazar didn't do it. But it says, if you look at uh, um, uh, if you look at, at what do you call it? I, I may have an answer for you. I may have an answer for you. I think I do have an answer. As a matter of fact. Because it says, uh, go back to that second pulse. Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron Akoyin Yishivas Chamasu Avadei So Bekanos Kinasi Bissocham. Bissocham. Yeah, this 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 actually will answer the question. The Sfas Emma says that it had. What does Bissocham mean? So the the plain meaning is that he, he he took my my vengeance among them among the Jewish people, but the Sfas Emma I think it was the Sfas Emma says it had to be a Jew an ordinary Jew. Bisocham means somebody from among the ordinary Jews. It couldn't be a prominent Jew, which Elazar was at this point. Elazar is a coin, is the coin godal. It has to be, because Aaron has died already, it has to be an ordinary Jew who's going to stand up for this. To, 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 that's what the Sfas Emes says. It could be that that's why Elazar didn't do it or he didn't think of it. Why was specifically Pinchas who thought of it? Exactly how it goes about. He's the son of the coin god, but he's not concerned. He has no prominent position. He's no official position. It has to be somebody in the Jewish people, a, 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 an ordinary, what you call an ordinary person, as opposed to somebody of prominence. Because somebody of prominence, that's expected of him. We need somebody who it's not expected, who takes the step forward, and he's willing to do it. That's what the unfortunate says. Okay, now, take a look at the word, Heshivas Chamasi. Before we look at Heshivas Chamasi, turn back for a second. Turn back to a second to Parshas Truma. Um, uh, sorry, Parshas, uh, Parshas, um, Kisisa, Kisisa, not, not Truma. I'll tell you what page is, what page? Thank you. Okay, on page 487, 484, 484, just keep your finger on the place here. So you'll notice on page 484 it says like this. This is where the command for the Jewish people to give the half shekel coin. They're making a donation to the Beis Amigdash. Okay. And so it says like this. Um, third line. 
third line on page 484, towards the end of the line. Zeyit nu kol over al pekudim, this is what everybody must donate. Machatzi sa shekel b'shekel akosh, a half shekel coin. Everybody's going to have to make a donation. 484, third line. 484, third line. Machatzi sa shekel b'shekel akosh. Everybody's going to have to give a, a, a half shekel coin. Now, uh, uh, if you notice, the word tzedakah, the letter tzaddik, the letter tzaddik, tzedakah, is from the same, or the, the same root, right? Tzaddik is tzedakah. Tzedakah means righteousness. A tzaddik is a righteous person. If you look in the middle of the word machatzis, look at the word machatzis, four lines down, four lines down, machatzis, the half shekel coin. What's the middle letter? A tzaddik. What are the two letters on the outside of the tzaddik, the closest letters? On, what, on the right side is a ches, on the left side is a yud. Chai. That means tzedakah brings life closer. Look at the two outside letters. A mem on the one side and a tough on the other side. What do you got? Mace. Tzedakah brings life closer and it pushes death far away. Tzedakah brings life closer and pushes death far away. That's what tzedakah is surrounded by chai, and mace is pushed far away. Now, the reason that is, there's a, the Gemara says, you, you know, before, on Yom Kippur, on Yom Kippur people give, you give tzedakah. There's a statement that says, tzedakah tatzil mimavis. Tzedakah saves from death. Why does tzedakah save from death? Tzedakah is one of the greatest merits. A person who's got a life-threatening situation, one of the first things a person should do is give tzedakah. Why? Why does tzedakah save from death? There are two basic ideas. One is that imagine a poor man and this poor man is literally starving to death. And he needs 10 cents to buy a roll, to buy a piece of bread. He needs 10 cents. He's got 9 cents. And you give him a penny. Now he can buy the piece of bread. With your penny makes him able to buy, he eats this piece of bread, and then because of that piece of bread he's able to stay alive. And then the next day he finds a job, and after that he becomes a multimillionaire, and then he gives you a big, 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 big thank you, but no money. Okay, so this guy, you didn't expect that, did you? You expected a big check, right? So, uh, so this guy stayed alive. You kept him alive by giving him tzedakah. Therefore, mida keneged bida, Kodesh Baruch Hu pays you back in, 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 in kind. You kept him alive, therefore tzedakah keeps you alive, number one. Number two, where do most people get money from? How do you ever get a hold of money? You work. You work. When you work, what are you doing? You're using up part of your life because it's your time. So when you're giving away money, in fact, what are you actually giving away? You're giving away part of your life. So tzedakah tatzil mimaves, tzedakah saves from death because you gave up part of your life and therefore mita kenegad mita, you get life. That's, a, that's why the letters, I heard a, there's a, what's a, 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 what do you call it, there was a, uh, a kolo guy. Now, yeah, I don't know if you guys know how kolo guys live. I know kolo guys who measure out. You know how you get these, uh, you, you, you get these uh, 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 little, these, uh, these things, of the, what do you call it, the sour cream that you eat, the leban, and actually these things that they serve in the little plastic cups that you buy. There are kolo guys who count each one of them. They're, they're living on such a tight budget that they're living and they're, they're counting out everything. There are kolo guys who count out how many pieces of chicken they're serving for Shabbos. I know people like that. So there's this one guy, he has his family, and he has one chicken for the entire family for Shabbos, and it's all, you get like a wing or a drum, you know, you're not, not, and it's counted out. And one Thursday night, he gets a knock on the door, and some lady's at the door, she says, I, please, I want a piece of chicken. So the guy says to her, look, you know, I have a family, I, I only have one chicken, if I can't give you a piece, one of the kids isn't going to get their chicken for Shabbos, you know. He says, I want a piece of chicken. And they've already got it in the refrigerator, the chicken's cut up and they're waiting to be cooked the next day. And he says, I can't give you, so, so she keeps begging for a piece of chicken. So he says to her, all right, you know what, I'll do without my chicken this Shabbos. So he goes over to the refrigerator, he opens up the refrigerator, his three-year-old son had crawled into the refrigerator and had closed it on him, it was already turning blue in the refrigerator. Because he went in there to get the to get the, the chicken to give her tzedakah, to give her the piece of chicken, so his son's life was saved. That's stuck at Tatsumi Mavis. When a person when a person is what do you call it? And by the way, you see other places where it says that honoring parents, what is the reward for honoring parents? Long life, longevity. Do you know that there was a guy in 9-11 whose mother told him, 
his mother told him that he should leave. When the first tower got hit, his mother called him up in the second tower. She said, I want you to get out of there. She said, don't worry, Ma. This is a one-off, the first tower. We'll be fine. And he didn't listen to his mother, and he died. And the difference between listening, between life and death would have been if he would have obeyed his mother. That's, that's honoring parents. So you don't know how things work out in life. Well, we only know that the Torah says it's not a joke. The Torah says, the Torah says this, is, this is what happens. So, so machatzis, sedaka tatzil mimaves. Now turn back to the ranch. Go back to Pinchas. Look what Pinchas did. Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron HaKohen, heishiv es chamasi, he turned back my wrath. Look at that word wrath, gentlemen. Look at the two middle letters of wrath, mace. Look at the two outside letters, chai. And Pinchas turned back the wrath. He turned it inside out. He separated the mace and turned, brought life closer. So, so that's what the Vilna Gaon says. That's what's alluded to over here. Okay, now. No coincidence. No coincidence, yeah, yeah, yeah. Another one of the coincidences in Torah. Now, here comes the big question. If you take a look at Pesach uh, Yudalad. Uh, now stay with this, gentlemen. This is a big question here. V'shem ish Yisrael hamuke, the name of the Jewish man who was smitten, Asher Huka Esa Midyanis, who was smitten with the Midianite woman, Zimri ben Salu, his name is Zimri, Nisi base of Lashimoni, a prince, he was a prince of the head, one of the heads of the tribe of Shimon. The Shema Isha Hamuka Hamidyanis, Kozbi Bastzur, the name of the Midianite woman is Kozbi, Rosh Umos base of a Midian Hu, she's a Midianite princess. Now I got two big questions here. Question number one, is you'll notice a double terminology by the man. It says, Shem Ish Yisrael Hamuka, who was smitten, Asher Huka Esa Midianis, who was smitten with the Midianis. He was smitten, it could have just said the name of the Jewish man who was smitten with the Midianis. Why did it say the name of the Jewish man who was smitten? Who was smitten with the Midianis. You hear the double terminology. Number one, why? And by her it only says, Shem Aisha Hamuka, the woman who got smitten. That's question number one. Why does it double terminology by the man? And by her, there's only one. What do you say? Oh, very good. Did you hear what he said? Maybe there's more of an Aveira on the guy. That begs another question. Did she do an Aveira at all? A Jewish man's not allowed to live with a non-Jewish woman. No prohibition for a non-Jewish woman to live with a non-Jewish man. What'd she do wrong? Why she gotta die? So what? So what? There's no tzniyas by them. She was like, and she, what, 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 why does she got to die? Why does he got to die? Why does she like got to die? It's like a reminder to the family of the shame, like he said with the animal. A hundred percent exactly what the commentary say. Number one, she was trying to incite him to sin. As an inciter, she deserves to die. She wasn't doing it for her. She was doing it purposely to get him to sin. So that's already she deserves to die. But the commentaries actually say the, the same thing when you kill an animal by bestiality. Why did the animal deserve to die? Because he was the cause of the sin. He was the cause of the sin, so he's got to be taken out. And number two is there shouldn't be shame for the family. So she has to die because she's the cause of sin over here. Even if she's sinless, she's, uh, she's the cause of sin. She has to die, number one. Number two, number three, number four, I don't even know what number on. But why the double terminology? So Eitan said because his, sin, his Avera is bigger. So the Orachayim HaKodosh. You were just there yesterday? Did he go? How was it? Hot? That's what I thought. Amazingly hot. Yeah. Let me have the tissue, please. The, uh, the, the Orachayim HaKodosh says, the first Ash Ish Yisrael HaMuke, Muke means he's already smitten from the world to come. He's already smitten from the world to come because of his Avera. That's the first one. Asher Huka Samidyanis is talking about the physical act of killing him with the Midianite woman. But he is already, his Neshama is already cut off. She doesn't have a neshama to cut off. So by her it only says once. But he's got the Jewish neshama. His Jewish neshama is cut off because of what he's doing. So muka asher huka. That's question number one. Now question number two is a bigger, this is a bigger question. And I want you to tell me the question. I want you to tell me the question. Starting from the shame ish Yisrael, hamuka, tells us his name. What's the question? It's a very big, basic question here. It's not, the, it's not deep, but it's very, very basic. But it's very, very prominent. What is the obvious question here? 
He's a, he's, an, he's a Jewish man. What's the obvious question here? Why do we need to specify that she was the daughter of the king? That tells, uh, that's going to be part of the answer. That's going to be part of the answer. What's the question? Look back. Look back. Look back. Turn back a page. What did Pinchas do? What did Pinchas do? What does it say? Pinchas goes, take a look when the action, when the actual event took place. What does it say? Take a look, they were weeping. And take a look at uh, eight lines from the bottom of the page. Vihine ish mi bene Israel ba, on page A74, eight lines from the bottom. Vihine ish mi bene Israel ba, a Jewish man came along. And he brings close the Midianite woman. And then what does it say in two lines down? What didn't it do? And what does it do over here? What's the difference between here and there? These two pages. What's the difference? Big question, gentlemen. Come on, you guys can get it. Obvious question. What's the obvious question? Yeah, Moshe. Correct. It didn't, why are they only identified over here, almost as an afterthought? It didn't mention a word over here. All it said was a Jewish man, a Jewish woman, and a, and a what do you call it? it? didn't say who they are. He had the chance for Teshuvah and not bring shame to his name. Uh, to his name. Chance for Teshuvah, I mean, yeah, so tell me his name in his chance for Teshuvah. Oh, you mean it doesn't want to shame his name? Yeah. Well, he didn't have no chance for it. Once he killed him, he certainly didn't have He could have told us who it was. And only as an afterthought, all of a sudden, at the end of the story, he said, oh, by the way, it was Zimri, the head of the tribe, and it was uh, Cusby, the daughter of a, of a Midianite king. The answer is, the answer, anybody got an idea? That's the question. The question is, why are you only identifying them now? What's the answer? For the ancestors? No, you're guessing. You're, what do you say, Moshe? And therefore what? Number one, it's very difficult. Number one, it's very difficult to get, to get involved. Like, whoa, you know, I don't know why I'm going to get involved. You know, there was a, there, in, in, in Italy, there was a trial for 300 mafia guys. There was a judge in Italy whose sentence put 300, a few years ago, he put 300 mafia guys in prison. You know, I, listen, I, I don't know, uh, if I was a judge, you know, I would have gone out and played golf that day. I definitely would not be the judge sitting to try put away 300, 300 mafia guys. And once I do that, I would definitely find somewhere to go. I think, I hear New Zealand is great for, 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 for judge protection programs, you know. I would find, I'd go to the, go to the, what do you call it? I would go to the Amazon rainforest. Anything is better than having the relatives of 300 mafia guys coming after you. So, but he did it. He had the guts to do it. Sometimes it takes a lot of guts. You gotta have a lot of guts. I mean, Pitlis says, hey, listen, this is a Midianite princess, and this guy's from the tribe of Shimon. None of that was a concern for him. He wasn't concerned with who their people. He was a Jewish man and a non-Jewish woman doing it out there. That's what's going through his mind. Number one. Number two, there's a second reason why you might want to do it. And there's a, there's a reason why you might not, not want to do it. But there's another reason why you might yes want to do it. Which is what? Jealousy? No. Sometimes, you know, I could be a hero. I killed the Jewish man. I killed a prominent guy. Not only that, you can either become famous, and sometimes people do it to become infamous. How come you know names? You know, how come you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, Oswald. Lee Harvey Oswald. How come you know his name? Because he killed a prominent person. So now we know his name. Infamous, but we know his name. How come you know James Earl Ray? Because he killed a famous person. These are all, Charles, what's his name? Hinckley. What was his name? Uh, uh, Hinckley. All these, all these guys who killed people or shot at people, sometimes people do it because they, if I'm not going to become famous, I want to become infamous, but I want people to know about me. None of that was a concern for Pinchas. When he did it, all he saw was a Jewish man and a non-Jewish woman. Then the Torah tells us, and as an afterthought, do you know who these people were? Do you know what the difficulty factor was here? Do you know how they, like in the Olympics, they hold up a, when they do a dive, right, from the platform, they, they all, there's like the, the degree of difficulty. 
Uh, certain dives have different degrees of difficulty. There's a degree of difficulty over here. For different reasons, there's a degree of difficulty, in all of which would affect whether or not Pinchas is allowed to do it. Is he a murderer or is he doing the right thing? If Pinchas has any thought whatsoever for personal, personal honor, then he would be allowed to do it. Then he's just a murderer. Then he's not a Kanoim Pogimbo, because Kanoim Pogimbo has to be with perfect motivation. And therefore, the Torah tells you all he saw was a Jewish man, a Jewish woman, and a non-Jewish woman. That's all he saw. They happen to be very prominent people. Okay, that's an afterthought. He would have done it to anybody at any time. Therefore, the Torah only names them after the fact. Okay. Now, the Torah then says like this. I want to tell you an important uh, insight into human nature. Hashem al Moshe Labor. Sororas Hamid Yonim. I want you to, how does the art scroll uh, translate it? Harass, Harass the Midianites. Vihikisem Oso. You're going to go to Midian, and you're going to fight the Midianites. Now here is not telling you the actual war. The actual war is going to come later. Right now it's telling you what's going to be the Torah. It's telling Moshe, you are going to do this. And one of the things you're going to do is you're going to harass the yeah, art school translate is harass, it's a literal translation. But there are different opinions what soror means. What does it mean, soror is a midyonim? And you're going to go and you're going to fight the midyonim because of this whole incident of Baal Peor. Okay. Now, what does harass mean? So there is a concept like this. When the Jewish people would fight, when they would go to war, so there was a tactic that they used where when they surrounded a city, they would only surround it on three sides, not four sides. When you surround the city on four sides, it doesn't allow anybody to escape. That means even when Jews fought wars, they fought a war with compassion. I mean, we see this today where the Israeli army is held to different standards than, uh, than most other armies. You know, uh, what's the name? Putin, Putin shoots missiles at children's hospitals and nobody says boo. You know, the, the, United, the, the United Nations Security Council suddenly, suddenly isn't aware of the, of the news. Where, where, the, where in, in Israel, you know, if they kill a terrorist who needed dying, so all of a sudden there's a, there's a major wedding, oi, you know, oi, you know, oi. So, so, so the, the Jews always fight wars differently. So even when they went to war, they left one flank open, which gave the inhabitants the option of escape. Now, here... The Torah says, when you fight the Midianites, you're going to tsororis a Midianim. When you go to war against her, you're going to be closing in on all sides. Now, that's the plain meaning over here. But I want to take this somewhere else. When you close somebody on four sides, when you surround them on four sides, it sometimes works against you. As an invading army, it's sometimes worth leaving one flank open. Why? Then when you're when you're surrounded on four sides, you're going to fight like crazy. They're going to fight. They're, they're anyway. They're going to die. So they'll take as many. So sometimes it is strategically sound. To I mean, when you surround on four sides, you're certainly delivering a message. That, you know, hey guys, you know, get in, get your last meals, uh, because you know we're surrounding you. On the other hand, it may work against you to a certain extent because you're not giving them the option. This is an extremely important rule in interpersonal relationships. When you're dealing with people, particularly with Yiddishkeit, parents raising kids, don't surround them on four sides. Don't choke them. Because the kids are eventually going to fight back. Don't surround them. Don't, don't, don't choke them off on four sides. You got to leave people a little bit of an opening. If you ever have a discussion with a friend, sometimes you have people who are asking, what are you doing in yeshiva? And well, I think that this, and they get you all their opinions about how we come from gorillas and other, and other such intellectual, uh, uh, in, uh, what do you call it? And, and anybody you're arguing with, never be, don't bury them. Because what's going to happen is, even if you're right, all he's going to do is he's going to walk away feeling that was a very unpleasant experience with a religious person. Let a person say face. Keep it, let them have the last like, well, when I meant that I don't believe in God, I meant I do believe in God. But they, you know, yeah, even though he's contradicting himself outright, but let him say face. Because then he'll walk away. If you, you'll maybe lose the battle, you win the war. The other way you win the battle, you lose the war, because the guy says, that was a very unpleasant experience. I certainly don't want to have anything to do with religion, because these religious people are so, they made me feel bad. 
And therefore, you know, and it's a, it, it works with everything. It works with, in, in Yiddishkeit, especially when you're raising children. Sometimes parents are a little too heavy with the kids. Somebody just asked me recently, what if my nine-year-old doesn't like benching? He doesn't like the bench. What should I do as a parent? So people, you got a bench, you got a, you know. You know, life isn't, you know, nine years old, he's a little pitzel. I had my own kid. My own kid once, my wife came to me, she said to me, uh, Plony's upset, he doesn't want a bench. I said, why don't you want a bench? Because I want another brownie. Mommy won't give me another brownie. I said, don't bench. I don't care if you bench. Don't bench. You're not doing me a favor. It's between you and Hashem. I walked out of the room. Guess what? He benched. <laughs> not doing a favor. And I, my other kid who didn't like, he didn't like, I don't like benching. You like benching? Oh, my favorite, benching. Let's bench. Everybody let's bench. Baruch, who I bench? I just ate. I can't bench. I just ate. I'm full. I, the benching always comes in a, at, a, at an inconvenient time. Especially Friday night after a meal. You're like this after Friday night after the meal. I got a bench. Okay, watch bench. Baruch, hey, save and abuse. Baruch, atash. You know, you know. Okay. So I told my kids, when my kid was little, you know, I said, say the first paragraph. Sometimes the kids take the benches like, I did that on purpose. Next thing you know, next thing you know, he's done, he's done before he started. I said, don't, don't, don't go. Say the first paragraph. Finished. Really? Really? Yeah, just say the first paragraph. Baruch That's it. But if you're going to close it off on four sides, all you do, you choke them off. It leaves a bad taste. You don't do that. That's what the third seed. That's what Surah. So, so here it happens to be that you're going to fight the Midianites because you wipe them out. You're going to surround them on four sides. But in general, in life, in general, in life, don't have to, you know, not every, uh, uh, leave people room to breathe. And especially in Yiddishkeit, with raising children, make sure you leave room. What were you going to ask, Eitan? You make sure, make sure you leave people room to breathe. That's one of the, one of the mistakes people make. I, for good purpose, we want our kids to be better than us. So we don't want them to repeat our mistakes. So we want our kids to be perfect and everything else. But sometimes there's something called trying too hard. And you're putting on a little too much, little too much pressure. A little too much pressure. Take it easy. Take it easy. We go. We go easy on ourselves. We go pretty. We're pretty good to ourselves. We could be. We could go easy on our kids. All right, gentlemen. Tomorrow I may or may not be here, depending on how I'm feeling. Because tomorrow's a fast day. So uh, we're gonna officially. We'll